I'm Nellie Galan, and I beat the often path by being an immigrant and never giving up. Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast. I'm your host, Ross Palmer. Boy, do we have a show for you today. Holy cow. Nellie Galan is one of those guests that makes me feel like the scene in Wayne's World where he says, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Her story is everything that this show represents. She came to this country as an immigrant when she was just five years old with literally nothing and through her own grit and determination worked her way up to become the president of entertainment of Telemundo, building a huge television career. She's working and heading one of the most well-known brands in all of television. She's produced literally hundreds of hours of TV for big networks. She's also appeared on most major networks and shows like The Apprentice and all kinds of other stuff, developing formats, showing up on the camera, you name it. But always an entrepreneur at heart, she has done very well for herself in real estate. She's built multiple successful businesses. She's an author, a powerhouse, and the creator of a new nonprofit called the Adelante Movement. In short, I'm in awe, folks. So here's... Nelly Galan. So I feel that you've undersold yourself a little bit there because you have achieved so many incredible things in your life. Some people have called you a media mogul. You have an entertainment dynamo, all of these titles. So tell us a little bit about who you are and a brief overview of your career up to this point. Well, I think it really does boil down to what I said of being an immigrant, because today we're listening to everything that's going on in Ukraine, for instance. And it really triggers me because I don't think most Americans think that you're going to wake up one day and something horrific is going to happen in your country. And from one day to the next, you have to leave your country, speak a new language, and your parents are broke. And that's exactly what happened to me. Uh, I had a very similar situation to the Ukraine. I am from Cuba and my parents in the late sixties were in the middle of a revolution, could not leave the country. All of a sudden uh, they bought their way out. Uh, We lost everything. I mean, we came with the shirts off our back. And so I was five years old and I came to this country with two parents that were completely depressed, distraught, had no money, didn't speak English. Neither did I, but I had to quickly learn it and become the translator, the therapist, the money maker, everything. So to me, everything goes back to me being not only an immigrant, but a refugee, a political refugee, because I think it's it's one thing to wake up and say, I'm going to leave my country and I'm going to go cross the border. And that's one kind of trauma. And the other kind of trauma is you're sitting in your place, which is fine. And your parents have a degree and they went to college and they have money. And you're like, we're going to leave. We have to go to a new country. We're going to go work as like day laborers. We're going to do everything. And we don't speak the language. And it's a complete shift of your entire reality. And that's what happened to me. So I think everything else that's come to me, like when people say to me, you know, we just went through a pandemic and listen, I get re-triggered like anybody else because I know what it is to have the first big experience of your life that you remember be a horrific trauma. And everything from that point on is like, I can figure out anything at this point. And by the way, it's good for everybody to hear that, you know, as someone older and wiser, that bad years happen to your to you in your life many times. So if you don't know how to handle that, good luck, because not everything is happy or great. And we've been a little spoiled in this country. Yeah. So that's, I think, that's the starting place. That's a great starting place. And you come and the disrespect and the negativity that you get as well. So like you said, you're coming from a place of position and then you come day laborers. So being treated so badly as well. From the start of this American experience, I can only assume. Well, I have to say, I have to say that I had a very unique experience, uh, which I wish most immigrants or refugees would have today, because at the time there was the Cuban Revolution, Cuba was really important to the United States. I mean, John F. Kennedy did the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? They wanted, there was a whole issue in America, the Cold War, the Russians, the uh, communism, Cuba had become communist. So America wanted Cubans here. So, I, you know, most people don't know that 
Cubans back then, I was adopted by a, an American Republican family. Really? They took us in that we lived with for a year and they treated us like we were their family. Now, when we, when my parents went out to work, it was like, oh my God, like these people are treating us like we're their family. And then out at work, they were treated like minority immigrants that were not wanted, but America did want Cubans here. So we didn't have as bad of an experience as other immigrants or other refugees have today. So I even feel worse for them. But yes, the fact that you lose all your money. I mean, that's my biggest fear in life. Isn't that your biggest fear that you'd wake up and oh, 100%. Banks would close down and you wouldn't have any money? My yes. parents had no money, nothing like we had to we had to get clothes given to us from church people. So it is, you know, this weird combination of like, you know, I'm a super patriot because I had Americans treat me like like a little princess when I came here. So I experienced uh, racism or or like, you know, just or, or I don't know, classism from out on the street, but not from the family I lived with. Um, and and but it's, it is all these weird things that I just don't think as Americans, honestly, I don't think Americans, including me, are prepared. We've had a beautiful, entitled life. Yes. We don't understand that shit happens. Right. Horrible shit to people all over the world. And it can and probably will happen to us. And I think it will happen to my kid in his lifetime. So few people have ever experienced anything like that. That's such a wonderful start. So you said, I love that you said from that moment, you realized that you needed to become the breadwinner and the therapist. So you felt I've got to take care of my family. Yeah. So how did that go? I'm here. I am a Latina. Right. And I don't think a lot of Latinos or like my kid or any Latino kid today maybe wakes up and thinks I want to be a millionaire. You know, maybe I I love when I see American kids and they tell me I want to be a movie producer. I want to be this. Those are all jobs that you better have a trust fund or something, because, you know, these are like roll the dice careers that you can't like, you can't be assured money. Right. I didn't have the privilege of thinking that way. Like I remember being a little kid and, you know, that's why I relate so much to Robert Kiyosaki and rich dad, poor dad. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and I think that book was life-changing for me because I thought like him, like his, his parents were professors, but they were broke and his Jewish neighbors were making money. And I think because Jews had trauma before. And so they figured it out. And I also lived in an all Jewish town in New Jersey and all my Latino friends and everything were like, Oh, what you know, they were thinking like day laborers because that's what their parents ended up having to be. Right. And I was thinking like, Oh, hell no, I got to be rich because I can, and I not only have to be rich, I have to remember every single thing my parents told me that they did wrong right. and never do that again. Don't do any of it. None of it. That kind of being secure that you're living in a country that everything is going to be okay. And, you know, it's interesting because now that I've studied Cuba, Cuba had three revolutions before the one that we had. And I'm sitting there going, how did my parents, like, again, you get comfortable really quick. Like, yeah. well, that's never going to happen to me. My parents were like, we thought, well, Americans are never going to let Cuba go communist. Well, guess what? It did. It did. Right? So we sit around here and think, and, you know, I wrote my book self-made from that place mm. that I know what could go wrong. So how do we plan ahead? And how do women, and I, I specifically talk to women because I think women, you know, did have a an economic revolution this whole me too thing and an economic revolution after the 2008 almost crash in our country where so many of their fathers and husbands lost their jobs and they were not doing well in corporate America and they had to run and start becoming entrepreneurs and in a gig society. So like, let's drive an Uber, let's go sell my clothes on eBay in a very simple way but it was the beginning of an ec- economic revolution where women here had to start thinking, maybe I just can't count on Prince Charming and somebody else helping me. Uh, I wanted to to switch gears a little bit. So your, your television career, how did you get involved with television? Because you said this a roll of the dice career. How on earth never, did you right, find yourself? Never. I would have never. I mean, I'll tell you what happened. So going back to the the immigrant and being my parents therapist and this and that and the other. 
in the seventh grade, uh, my parents put me in all girl Catholic school. And my parents, that was part of their backstory that they thought, oh, Catholic school for girls, but they really couldn't afford it. They were going, you know, my parents had a very up and down situation uh, economically. And in the seventh grade, uh, I would overhear my parents at night and my mother would say, ¿Qué vamos a hacer? No podemos pagar. We cannot pay for this school. What do we do? And my father would say, don't worry, Jesus will help us. My father was like super Catholic. My mother was more of an atheist because that's the other weird thing about Cuba is like, you know, uh, religion was abolished in a communist regime. So some people were kind of brought up atheist and some people were like still Roman Catholic. My parents, my father's family was from Spain and they were Roman Catholic. And I kept thinking, oh, yeah, Jesus is going to help us. The nun is not going to care. She's going to kick me out of the school. And I had that, like, stomach ache that all the kids could pay for school and I couldn't. And this old Jewish lady in my Jewish town um, said to me, I sell Avon. Honey, why don't you sell Avon and I'll give you some free lipstick? And I thought to myself, that's the only place that I thought maybe I could make some money that I knew of. So I went to the lady and I said, listen, I want to sell Avon cosmetics. I don't even know if you know what that is. Like, oh yeah, I know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they sold door to door. Yep. And, uh, she, and I said, I'll sell Avon, but I got to split the money with you 50, 50. And she said, okay. I mean, no, t- I mean, what 12 year old is selling a- I mean, I couldn't sell Avon on my own. They wouldn't have let me. So she was like, okay, fine. And the first week I sold Avon out of my locker to the girls in my school and their moms, I made 200 bucks. Whoa. And I started paying down my tuition and a month into it, I had made $800. So like that was back then that was like half my tuition. Amazing. So, um, but then I thought my dad is going to lose it. He's going to be real. Cause you know, in Latino culture, it's all about the men providing and all that. So I went to the nun and I said, you got to write me a letter home that I got a scholarship. And she writes me a letter and I bring it to my parents and uh, my my mother goes, ¿Qué dice? what does these letters say? And my father said, um, oh, my God, your daughter is a genius. And Jesus <laughs> helped us after all. Of course. <laughs> and I think that was the beginning of a very big life change for me because I realized I could help my parents. In, the, in my sophomore year in high school, in the same school, I write a story for school. By now, I'm a little more empowered, right? Because I'm making money. I'm now also like a secret money maker, right? I write a story for school. My favorite nun in English class says to me, I don't think you wrote this story. Like, again, underestimating me. Mm. When I was like really good in school, okay? Yeah. And, and she says, I think you stole this from Ernest Hemingway. And, I, and, she, and she suspends me for three days. And I go home and I tell my parents... And my parents are like, go ask for forgiveness of the nun. Because my parents, by this point, who used to be empowered people, by the way, empowered people can end up not being empowered, Mm. had been so beaten down by making no money. By My father had learned somewhat English. My mother really wasn't good at languages. My mother was a teacher. Now she was a seamstress. So they had like lowered themselves. And they go, just ask for forgiveness. Like, you know, afraid of speaking truth to power. And at that moment, the nun was powerful. And I got so mad that I wrote an article for 17 magazine, which was the magazine that I read as a teenager about why you shouldn't send your kid to all girl Catholic school. Whoa. And I sent it in three days later, I went back to school. The nun goes, you know, you really did write it. I'm sorry. You got an A. The whole thing blew, blew away. Three months later, I get a hundred dollar check in the mail from 17 magazine. We are publishing your story. And I'm freaking out because I'm like, Oh shit. What did I say? Yeah. They published the article and my worst fear happened, which was to ever be called in the principal's office. I kept thinking I'd be called in the principal's office because my parents couldn't pay for the school. Instead I got, I got reamed for writing this article. And I, they, they said to me, we don't like, we don't like your kind here. We don't like this again. That's where I became a minority and I got expelled from the school. Wow. So my parents are like, again, take the side of the nun and go, you go back and you beg forgiveness. And I said, you told me that we came to this country for freedom of speech. 
to speak up, to have a voice. I said, I'm going to school with African-American friends. I go, we, you know, Martin, this is the country of Martin Luther King. This is the country where people speak up. And my mother goes, no, you do not speak up. You go back and apologize. I called the board of ed of the state of New Jersey. An African-American man answered the phone, thank God. I said, are these nuns allowed to expel me? He goes, young lady, what happened to you is not right, but it is a private school and they are allowed to expel you for any reason. For any reason. But yeah. you do not have to take it. I can make you an appointment to speak to the local newspaper. You tell their, your story. And that's how people like us have a voice. And I very impulsively said, okay. And I got interviewed by the local paper. And the next day it came out, Cuban girl gets expelled for First Amendment issue. And I thought my parents were going to kill me. And literally they were like, we don't know what to do with you. You are a bad child, blah, blah, blah. And we get a call from the nun of my school. And I cannot tell you that I remember as the worst experience of my life, driving with my parents to the nun, with my parents saying, why are you, why did you do this to us? And like crying, we don't even want to have to speak English. Like they were ashamed to even have to go and speak to this nun. It was like all shame. And I'm thinking to myself, that's it. I'm dead. I'm a, I'm like a dead person. And I get there and you're not going to believe what happens. The nun is like super nice. (laughs) And she says, I'm so sorry. You misinterpreted what I said. I didn't say that we were kicking you out. I just said that I didn't like what you did. And in fact, I've now looked at all your records and you're like the number three student in this school and you have such a great record. In fact, you are so good and you've done, you're so in all AP classes that you have enough credits to graduate. So we're graduating you a year and a half early. (laughs) What? And my parents don't even get it. And they go, oh, this is an honor. I go, yes, it's an honor, mom and dad. Let's go. And they didn't get it that I was being gotten rid of. Right. All right, team, this is that moment where we like to interrupt the show and remind you that if you have been enjoying this show, if you've enjoyed this episode, if you've listened to any of these episodes, please, please, please hit that subscribe button. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe on Spotify, your podcast platform of choice. Or subscribe on YouTube if you want to watch the video version of this and all episodes. That's where you can find it. You can find my website, rosspalmer.com. Spread the word. Share this episode. Help me grow this podcast if it's helped you at all. I would really, really appreciate it. So now back to the wonderful Nelly Galan. I get home. It is so weird. And for me, it made my whole entire life because I got home and there was a call in our voice box. At the time, we had voice boxes uh, from 17. And they said, we are so proud of you that you spoke up for yourself. Call us. We have decided to give you the youngest guest editorship in the history of 17 magazine. No. I ended up going. I lived in New Jersey, going into the city, which was like, you know, you never did that. Working at 17 Magazine, writing articles for 17 Magazine, getting into early admission at Barnard because of that. And I got and I got into Barnard. I went to Barnard for one semester. And because of my writing on 17 Magazine, 60 Minutes, the TV show, was starting a teenage version of 60 Minutes. And they called me and they said, We are doing a show with PBS for teens for Saturday mornings. And they thought, and by that, by that time, they thought I was in college. They were looking for like college students that look like teenagers still. They didn't know that I was so young. And they said, uh, and we want you to audition to be a correspondent on our show. And this is the best part of the story. I get the job, but they tell me you need to move to Austin, Texas in two weeks. In two weeks. In two weeks. And I told my parents, uh, I'm I'm leaving. I'm quitting school. I'm moving to Texas. And they go, you are not leaving this house till you get married. And 
I got up in the middle of the night, two weeks later, I got in my little Chevy Chevette that I had bought with the money. It was an old car. And my parents were crying, please don't leave us. You gotta go. And in that moment, I had to be selfish. And I walked out the door. I got in my car. I drove two blocks. I cried for two hours because I felt so guilty about leaving them. But I left them. And I went to Texas. And had I not done that, I would not have, you know, I was like Lisa Ling. Remember when Lisa Ling was like oh, a yeah. teacher? I Channel went one became, in my middle school I became years. a correspondent. From that job, I, I got recruited to CBS. I was a producer, a news producer slash correspondent stringer for CBS. From there, Norman Lear and Jerry Parencio, I interviewed them for CBS. And they go, we just brought the first Spanish TV station in America. I go, Ugh, I don't want to do that. And they go, young lady, are you stupid? The Hispanic market is going to be a $2 billion market. You speak Spanish and English? You're going to be employee one of a multi-billion dollar company. Are you rich? I go, no, I'm poor. They go, we're rich. <laughs> Leave CBS and being a correspondent and learn to run a business from the bottom up. Whoa. And I became the youngest station manager in television in the country. How old At were you 22. when that happened? 22. 22. Okay. Now people don't know this. TV stations in America are the meat and potatoes of TV. It's not glamorous. It's like running a Burger King. Okay. But you learn the business from the bottom up. First, second, third to so, market. They all succeed. Uh, right. And all right. So your experience, you or building this thing. And was the success more or less immediate? Was it apparent no. right away that you no, no, hit no, no, onto no, something? No, 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 I'm running this little TV station. It's the beginning of a business, right? So it doesn't, right. we're, 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 and it's a local station. So yes, I'm learning on the job with OPM, you know, how to build a little business, how to get advertisers, how to do everything, how to go by programming in Latin America, because there was no programming being done for Hispanics here. All of those things, I learned everything, but then they sold it. And when they sold it, I, my boss said to me, I said, how could you do this to me? This is my baby. And he goes, young lady, these are my chips. Go get your own chips. And he meant go start your own business. Wow. And at first I was really mad at him and this and that. And then I go, maybe I'm thinking too small. He's right. And so I start this little business and for four years, I make no money, nothing. I mean, I don't even know what I'm doing. I would never tell somebody. Now I would never say to somebody, don't just quit your job or leave your job and start a business. Like there's better ways to do it, but I did. Okay. And I cried for four years and I, I, I went back to being a stringer at CBS to make money. And a stringer is the person that does all the reporting and then they put on the news at night, you know, like the extra stories. And in the fourth year, my business took off. And, you know, my old boss would say, when I used to call him and go, it's not working. And he goes, young lady, when I was your age, I started a business. I made no money for 10 years. And in the 10th year, it hit. And I go, well, I'm, I guess I'm only on year four, you know, but I, there's easier ways to do it. So don't anybody do that. OK, um, in the fourth year, my timing hit. And I started working, uh, launching HBO in Latin America and ESPN in Latin America. And then Rupert Murdoch called me. He, had, he was coming to America to buy Fox. And he goes, I want to launch six channels abroad. And again, my, my language skills, two languages, double the money. <laughs> double the Three money, languages, yes. triple the money. I like it. I mean, really. So I started this little business. And then sure enough, a few years into the business where it was doing really well, Sony bought all these TV stations turned it into a network called Telemundo. And I was the one that had the most experience uh, running a station and buying programming and launching uh, American companies into Latin America. So they called me and said, we want to buy your little business and we want you to come and be the president of this network. Unbelievable. So who would have thought? Unbelievable. I ran the network for four years. Uh, I was distraught because they really wanted to sell it. I wanted to keep running it, but we sold it to NBC for a lot of money. 
And when NBC bought it, so I made, so I've made chunks of money. I mean, selling my business, I made a little chunk of money. I could have made more, but I didn't because I so desperately want that job. I didn't negotiate right. But when we sold Telemundo, I made another chunk of money. And then when NBC bought Telemundo, they realized we don't have anybody here that knows how to, how to make shows for this network. So I became Tyler Perry. And I was producing hundreds of hours of, of content. So I became a producer. And I, I mean, so I, there's much more to go, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you put a word in. I mean, that, well, I'm just like, my jaw is on the floor. This is such a remarkable story. Well, it's I knew it was going to be crazy, but this is really crazy. Well, a lot of life is timing. Uh, and, a lot of life, and a lot of life is finding a niche. Yeah. If you're trying to do what everybody else is doing, it's going to be harder for you. Yeah. I mean, if I had kept being a network correspondent for CBS, I probably would have been maybe like my highest and best use of my life would have been maybe to end up on the Today Show because they needed Latinos on the air. That would have been a Could great have computer, So that would right. have been bad. So I had a niche even in that, right? Sure. But I wouldn't have been an entrepreneur. Right. You're never going to make the money even in a niche, being an employee and being an entrepreneur. Never. Right. Never. Right. So I'm curious with the amount of financial literacy that you have, how do you feel about the difference between having a service-based business yeah. as an entrepreneur versus a product or a content business as yeah. an entrepreneur? Well, I, you know, just so that you know, uh, my original business, uh, my first business launching channels in, in Latin America was a service business. So I would go to HBO and say, I think I know how to take your content and put it in Latin America. I know the people we can sell the content to. I'm going to make you, I'm going to take your show. I'm going to dub it correctly or subtitle it in Spanish. And I'm going to make all the promos for you. And we're, I'm going to sell that whole package for you and you're going to pay me X, Y, and Z. I think there's nothing wrong with a service business uh, as your meat and potatoes business because it allows you to meet all the right people for your eventual uh, business that makes content or makes a product, right? Like, I think you have to get in the door of places that are sexy by doing service because they need that. And I think that you should use it as like your business school of also figuring out what do these people really need? Like, what else do they need? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and yes, eventually you should be in the product business. I am natural. I was born grounded because I'm a refugee and an immigrant. I know shit, bad shit can happen. You got to be grounded. You only put a percentage of anything in a risk thing. And you know, it's a risk and you have to be able to walk away that it could go away. And the rest of the stuff has to be grounded. Hence why I buy real estate. Now, at this point in my life, I'm over leveraged on real estate. So I'm out, I'm about to de like unravel a bit of that, right? But a building is a building is a building, right? So it could go down in value. It'll come back up. Right. It's solid. It will, yeah. But you don't put all your money in real estate. Okay, because look, I'm having a problem right now. I put a lot of money in my real estate in California. California is homeless ridden. Now, thank God, because I'm an immigrant and I've also saved a lot of money. I will not go under like so many of my friends because I can carry those buildings for years. So you have to be balanced and solid and grounded and then play a little bit and risk a little bit. And you know what? The other thing you, you have to realize is those of us that do really well in life fail a lot. You only have to succeed two or three times in your life and you'll be fine. Your story is one of the most profound and interesting I've ever come across. I think it's it hits all of the boxes because you've done so many things that I admire. Your financial literacy, but also your creative pursuits. You produced 700 episodes or God knows how many episodes of television. Well, I went back window. to school at 45 and I got a doctorate. You got and then you're a doctor in psychology, all of this crazy stuff. And I stuff. focused on the psychology of money, which is why I could write here. I'm going to my book. Yes, no, I, we're me. going to pitch it hard. Yeah, so, we're going to make so sure that everybody knows that, to buy that book. Uh, because I really, I wanted to go back to school. I think people should also hear that, that when I went back to school, I paid for my own school with my own money because I felt like it. 
not because I needed a degree at that point, not because I necessarily was going to practice to be a psychologist. I really wanted to study the psychology of money and particularly with women and multicultural people, because I noticed that there was like a barrier to entry that minorities don't in this country like feel like they can be rich. And there is a finance, there's a lack of financial literacy. And I really focused on that. And that's why I wrote this book because I feel like my mission, the rest of my life is to help people that don't believe they can wealth build. I want them to know that money is, and that being rich is not a dirty word, that billionaires actually have the ability to give back more to society than corporations, than the government, than anyone, because half the, half the money goes to taxes. They'd rather take the money that goes to taxes and donate it to causes. I don't think people realize that, that there are good people that are poor and there are bad people that are poor. There are good people that are rich and there's bad people that are rich. And I want to take the stigma out of wealth building for minorities, for women, for all these people that really don't think they can do it. I am so blessed to be in America. And I know that only in America could a woman like me that comes from another country that left as a refugee become a multimillionaire in one generation. And without being super genius, Harvard MBA, nothing. Dropped out of college, didn't go back to college till I was 45. And I did it slowly and calmly, step by step. I didn't buy shoes. I bought buildings. I live beneath my means. I didn't know anything about real estate. And at 31 started and by 45, I could retire on my real estate, not on my TV career. I've made five times the money on my investments than on my TV career. Wow. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. And to your point about giving back, we didn't have much time left, but you started the Adelante project as well. I did. So tell us a a brief overview of what that is. Yeah. Well, to, to really help, uh, I started out with Latinas and then I, I, all the other black women, Asian women, Middle Eastern women to really help all of those women become financially literate, to really explain to them. Nobody explains to us in school. Nobody really explains the American financial system that if you make money and you save money, you're not going to get to the end of your life. The whole system is based on making money while you sleep. So the money you make and the money you save has to be invested, has to grow over 20 or 30 years while you do something else. And that is the key to the American financial capitalistic system. If you don't understand that, you're going to end up in old age, you know, on welfare. And I don't want that for women. I wanted to inspire women so they could inspire their children and they could help wealth build and change the mindset of poverty in our communities. Uh, I would wish nothing more than for my own daughter to look at your example and to build a life and career along those lines. So again, I I thank you. And I would like to- Can I leave you with one thought? I was going to say, I, I was going to encourage it. Okay. Yes. Well, first of all, I love that you're married to a Latina. So congratulations. <laughs> to am, you yes. That's a Happily. beautiful thing. Uh, but I just want to say that I think my secret sauce that I'd love to leave all of you with is my best friends and my mentors are all 20 or 25 years older than me. My best friend is an 80 year old woman who's taught me everything I know about real estate. And I think young people today tend to think like, I know everything because, you know, we know social media and we know this and you guys don't. I just want you all to hear that someone like me, for instance, for women, I always say, why don't you come and ask me for help? I don't need anything from you. I don't compete with you. I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Just like my mentors that are 80 or 75 or whatever, They don't need anything from me. They love that I ask for help. And they, I don't do anything without calling. I have like a cabal of five women that are older than me. I don't even make a move without calling them. They go, no, you're not buying that. Yes, you're buying. Because they're like, I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm smarter than you. I don't know social media like you do. I don't, but I'm wise because I've been through everything and I'm going to save you a lot of steps. So find those people right around you. They could be relatives. They could be teachers. They could be people and invite them to lunch. 
ask, do something for them and make them your friend, because that is going to be your gold moving forward. Someone that doesn't compete with you, that doesn't want anything from you, that only wants to give to you their wisdom and listen to it. Uh, I wish you so much success on your next journey in the Adelante Project and all of the good things that you will do. I think that anybody who's smart should be paying you boatloads of money for your advice, and I hope that that is the case because you clearly have a lot, a lot to offer. So uh, with that, and our I'm time is up. And I'm very proud of you on your path, and I wish you total abundance. And as I say in my book, that you are rich in every way. And it sounds like you already have the love, the family, and that only bigger abundance comes, but, but keep taking it slow because this is a process and baby steps. I, that's exactly what I needed to hear. And with that, the official podcast is over. 